This video is sponsored by WeTV. Brothers. They come in all different forms. Big, little, undercover. But there's not a brother-brother relationship in hip-hop that has had more highs and lows than that of Jay-Z and Kanye West. Janye, KZ if you will. These two mecha egos spent years together on good terms making amazing art. But at a certain point, things seem to go as sour as Kim K's box, leaving Jay and Kanye frenemies. But to truly understand how these throne-washing legends of the rap game ended up on such shaky ground, we've got to go all the way back to the start. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks WeTV for sponsoring this video, and in case you didn't know, new season of Growing Up Hip Hop Atlanta premieres Thursday, January the 7th at 9pm 8 central. Go to WeTV.com to find out your local channel number and make sure you don't miss it. If you love that hip hop banter, you love growing up hip hop Atlanta. Big drama in front of the camera, in the lives of your favorite rappers. When you watch it, you'll be like, wow, I'm talking Waka Flocka and Bow Wow. In some crazy situations dealing with issues affecting the nation, like the COVID crisis and rise of the BLM movement. Cause just like me and you, your favorite rappers been going through it. So hit that link in description and go subscribe to WeTV if you're guest to watch growing up hip hop Atlanta just like me. Thanks WeTV, Growing Up Hip Hop Atlanta premieres Thursday, January the 7th at 9pm 8 central. Do not miss it. The year 2000 specifically, and after spending years slaving away as a ghost producer for D-Dot, aka The Mad Rapper, aka if I was in the room when Kanye made the beat then I produced the song, but eventually Kanye was able to transcend the ghost producing cage that D-Dot had kept him in, eventually landing the opportunity to make beats for, you know, someone good. And it was at the turn of the millennium that Kanye West finally landed upon the producer's holy grail. Making a track for none other than hip hop heavyweight Jay Z, the track This Can't Be Life on the Dynasty Rock La Familia album. Album. And having proven himself with a tight little placement there, Jay Z took note and enlisted Kanye to produce some tracks for his hotly anticipated Blueprint album. And Kanye's contribution to the Blueprint was immense. He didn't just make a few beats for the Blueprint. If you're asking Kanye, he basically drew up the Blueprints, put on a hard hat, and built the goddamn thing himself. Producing as well as contributing writing credits to some of the most iconic songs on the album. I'm talking the iconic Nas disc, The Takeover. That hitch single H to the Izzo, which pretty much single handedly popularized one of the most catchy. Jay-Z nicknames going. And in addition to those classic songs, Kanye also crafted a couple of Hartwell album songs for Jay-Z, including Heart of the City and Never Change. So the Blueprint album, and to a lesser extent Kanye's contributions to the album, are widely believed to have been the true revival of Jay-Z's career at this point, and it's safe to say that Kanye's contributions did not go unnoticed. From here, Yeezy became the Golden Boy producer over at Rockefeller Records handing in hit after hit, and not just producing hit songs for Jay-Z like many of the classic songs that ended up on the Black Album, but in this role, Kanye also produced Ludacris' number one hit single, Stand Up! Alicia Keys' number three hit single, You Don't Know My Name, which is funny because I don't know that song. And of course, very significantly, 03 Bonnie and Clyde, the Jay-Z Beyonce duet, which hit number four on the Billboard chart and number one in any Basic Bitches CD changer back in 03. Basically, in the early noughties, Kanye was racking up more plaques than Kodak Black's grill since he's been in jail. Problem was, with all of this success that Kanye was getting, it wasn't quite the right success he wanted. It turns out that Yeezy always wanted to be the one doing the rapping, but the record industry, including his own team and Jay-Z, just never believed in him behind the mic. And apparently part of the reason for this was the likes of Jay-Z, considering that Kanye's background as a normal guy left him lacking the hustling experience that the kind of rappers on the Rockefeller Records lineup would usually have. Apparently the way Jay-Z saw it, if you weren't on the corner slinging dope, you weren't qualified to be a rapper on the rock. Ironic coming from the man who signed Rick Ross. But anywho, everybody thought that Kanye's pink polo shirt and backpack was far too fruity for Rockefeller's rapping lineup of dope slinging gangsters. And really, the guys over at Rockefeller were trying to pull a D-Dot, just keeping Kanye West locked up in his cage, making beats, and keeping his mouth zipped. But hey, anybody that knows Kanye today knows that he is not a man to be told no. And apparently, even while still hustling as a producer for Rockefeller Records and delivering hit after hit for other big rappers, Kanye was still recording his own rap demos and trying to get deals as an artist at other labels. But apparently, time and time again, they would slam the door in his stupid face. So in fear of eventually losing Kanye West's premier beat making skills to another label who would take him seriously as a rapper, eventually Dame Dash's arm was duly bended and he was forced in order to keep Kanye West on the label to offer him a deal as an artist despite Jay-Z's heavy doubts. I want to know that I'm the newest member of the Rockefeller team. I'm 
So he was on the team, but people still weren't ready to take this pink polo rocking, backpack wearing, sweater over the shoulder, looking like a dollar store Ralph Lauren model motherfucker seriously. But that would soon all change when fortunately, unfortunately, Kanye West would accidentally pull an early Bruce Jenner, falling asleep at the wheel whilst driving home from a studio session and getting in a horrific car crash. And make no mistake, Kanye's accident was serious. He would suffer injuries so bad that he would need his jaw wired shut. Oh, and also the occupant of the other car had both of their legs broken, but let's not forget no one's legs other than Kanye's matter. I mean, just imagine getting into a car wreck with Kanye. You crawl out of the wreckage, you got no legs left, and he is just standing there over you. All like, don't worry, I'm gonna make you a new set of legs out of plywood. I'm the new Walt Disney, they're gonna have a new Yeezy attached to them. You should be proud that you had your legs broken by a musical genius. Anyway, in 2020, Kanye West having his mouth surgically wired shut is something we can only dream of. But back in 2002, this was the perfect bit of backstory to get fans excited about Kanye's music. Because rather than getting shot nine times a la 50 Cent, because in this case it was Kanye's reckless driving and subsequent debilitating injuries, which would make up for his lack of street credentials. Of course, Kanye would famously go on to record the song Through the Wire with his mouth still wired shut, a breakout track which quickly put Kanye on the map as a rapper with a story to tell. Through the Wire generated intense buzz for his debut album on the Rockefeller Records label, College Dropout, which we all know did eventually drop and became an enormous runaway success for Kanye. Debuting at number two, shifting over 400 40,000 units in the first week. Once fans and industry heads had gotten their hands on the college dropout, Kanye's talent on the mic was undeniable. He didn't need to have spent time chilling on the corner of a Marcy Project block to be taken seriously as a rapper, no matter what Jay-Z or Drake says. And from here, Kanye's artistry would carry him forward to the next level of hip hop. From here, he would reinvent himself with every single project and every album that he released would be an enormous sonic leap forward. Late registration with its orchestral influences, leading to graduations synth, pop anthems inspired by 80s ballads and a desire to make music that hit hard in the stadium. And in a way, when you see how much of an amazing artist that Kanye was becoming, you could see where a little bit of rivalry and jealousy may breed. I mean, compare this with Jay-Z's artistry when every album is essentially just the same old Sean with an added bit of backstory. You know, pretending he's gonna retire, pretending he didn't retire, pretending he didn't know what was going on on that tour bus. But regardless of which one you think is a better rapper, artist, or even business person, it's clear that at least in the fans' eyes by 2007, Kanye was in the same bracket as Jay-Z. And it was actually on the album graduation that Kanye would take his first step in turning his idol to his rival. As this project essentially features two tracks that are very important to this story. Of course, there's Homecoming featuring Chris Martin of Coldplay, and the song which kind of explains how that came to be, Big Brother, which is essentially where all of the problems between Jay and Ye started. Big Brother is essentially a Kanye song detailing his relationship with Jay-Z. A lot of what Ye says is complimentary and the overall song is definitely a favourable review of their friendship. I give my friendship with Jay-Z four stars. Nice guy, might try and hold you back a bit, definitely don't get in an elevator with him. In the song, Kanye praises Jay-Z for getting him out his mama's house and putting him in a position to buy his mama house. But as the song goes on, it kind of seems like these compliments towards Jay-Z begin to get a bit underhanded and generally see Kanye trying to take the credit for a lot of Jay-Z's success. I mean, Kanye pretty much outright claims the success of Jay-Z's revival on the Blueprint album all for himself. I mean, come on, yeah, you had four songs out of 30. You know, other producers who featured on the Blueprint album also include Just Blaze, who did the track Girls, 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 a big hit, Timberland, and of course, oh, just some little guy called Eminem. Anyway, Kanye goes on to drop more shade pointing out the fact that at the start of his career when he was trying to rap, Jay-Z did not take him seriously, with Kanye ultimately saying that being in Jay's shadow only made him want to succeed more, suggesting that Jesus Walks was the song that took him to the mainstream consciousness, and this essentially being the point where Kanye began to see Jay-Z as competition. The song culminates in the main point with Kanye basically saying he feels like Jay took his source by getting on a song with Coldplay. Of course, a reference to the fact that Homecoming, a track with Chris Martin from Coldplay, is on the Graduation album. However, only a year before, when Jay-Z released his comeback album, Kingdom Come, it featured the track Beach Chair, also featuring a tidy little feature from Chris Martin of Coldplay. But here's the crazy thing, right? After this song came out, Jay-Z actually rebuffed this specific lyric. Seeming almost gobsmacked, he says that he is the one who introduced Kanye to Chris Martin. Basically going on to say that despite the actual reality of the situation, you gotta respect this is just how Kanye feels it went down. Yet another insight into essentially the complete disconnect between reality and what Kanye perceives reality to be. In fact, on the topic of Jay-Z rebuffing lyrics from Big Brother, there are a couple of areas where it seems 
seems like Kanye completely twisted and misinterpreted the situation to make Jay-Z look bad. He has one lyric where he suggests that Jay-Z didn't invite Kanye to his final farewell show, The Fate of Black Show, at Madison Square Garden. Inferring this by suggesting that he was asked to buy two tickets, a claim that was duly rebuffed by Jay-Z, who said that Kanye was actually offered four free tickets, but he wanted six, hence why he was asked to buy two more. Though to be fair, I've got to give credit, for a split second we did see Kanye being at least a little bit humble, suggesting that Jay-Z kicked his ass on the Diamonds Are Forever remix, but I've got to say, all in, the track leans heavily towards Kanye pointing out Jay-Z as competition, and just generally suggesting that Jay had underestimated Kanye's creative genius. Apparently, upon hearing the track, Jay-Z reportedly was not upset, suggesting that the song was a fair portrayal of their relationship, and pointing out that the Rockefeller family is tough love. Hey, considering the fact that Jay-Z finessed Dame Dash out of $29 million, tough love indeed. But hey, if that wasn't enough pettiness from Jay-Z, apparently he also told Kanye that Big Brother was his best song since Jesus Walks. Ah, Jay-Z, the master of the underhanded compliment. But regardless, what was said was said. Jay-Z didn't hold it against Kanye, and Kanye was still fiercely looking to defend his Big Brother. And this was exemplified very publicly within a few years, when Kanye would step out in an attempt to defend Jay-Z and Beyonce's honor a little too hard, ultimately ending up in stepping on their toes. With tension building up between Kanye, Jay-Z and Beyonce in the years that would follow. Because in 2009, in a moment of public embarrassment so outrageously bad it would probably make Larry David die of cringe, Kanye West crashes Taylor Swift's speech for best female music video whilst on stage at the VMAs. And as we now know, this didn't really go to plan. Kanye had stepped on stage to try and defend Beyonce and maybe to a lesser extent Jay-Z's honor. However, if you watched my detailed video of that incident and the events that unfolded afterwards, then you'll know that the reality is actually Beyonce was mortified at Kanye's outburst, ultimately leaving Beyonce forced to give her speech for best music video, a superior award anyway, to Taylor Swift to make up for the speech that Kanye had taken from her on Beyonce's behalf. So really, Kanye's dumb, drunken actions that evening ruined two speeches. Now, Kanye got a public bashing for this in many years to come, and in some ways he's never even recovered from looking like such a jackass. But it didn't seem like in the immediate aftermath his relationship with Jay-Z was necessarily that impacted. No, this incident would really serve as foreshadowing. But what was to come in the future with Beyonce playing a significant role in the dynamic between Jay-Z and Kanye West? But clearly, Jay and Ye were on great terms in 2011, when they would bless the fans with the most iconic hip-hop joint album at least until Vinny Chase and Soldier Boy dropped Double Cup City. I'm talking, of course, of Watch the Throne. Following the release of this epic, epic joint album, they would go on a co-headlining tour beginning in Atlanta in October 2011, a tour that was so successful it was eventually extended from 23 to 34 stops, and then eventually expanded onto Europe for a global trip that totaled 47 nights and grossing a whopping $75 million Man, for that kind of $75 million bag, I'd go on a 57 city subway seat licking coronavirus tour. But obviously, with all of that time spent together on the road, eventually, naturally, Kanye would get underneath Jay-Z's skin. In 2013, we saw Jay venting about Kanye's difficult personality in a Zane Lowe interview, where he explained that the duo had actually agreed to move on to solo projects after Watch the Throne was wrapped up. But apparently, after hearing two new tracks that Jay had recorded for his new Magna Carta album, Kanye apparently got aggressive in insisting that they go and watch the throne, leading to a four-day argument, which at one point even sounded like it nearly got physical. And I played those records for Kanye, and he he was like, no, those have to go and watch the throne. So we spent four days arguing about those records. But, and, and, you know, not not Good. like fighting. Well, oh, it was some pushing at one point, but not between us, <laughs> right. just everyone else. And clearly these arguments had also gotten under Kanye's skin. Because when Jay-Z's solo Magna Carta album finally dropped, despite being absolutely flaming on Twitter, Kanye completely ignored the album launch. Instead, choosing amongst the fanfare of adulation of Jay-Z's new album on Twitter to tweet about having recently seen Pacific Rim. But by no means was this rowdy rimmer done ripping Jay-Z, oh no. Because Kanye would eventually take to the stage and tell fans specifically that he wasn't really fucking with Jay-Z and Justin Timberlake's recent output. And I got love but hope but I ain't fucking with that suit and tie. 
that on-stage outburst might not have been taken kindly by Jay and Bay, and trouble would be on the horizon once again in May 2014, as Kim and Kanye decided to combine forces and create the most obnoxious personality media empire in history, getting married in a big ceremony where Jay-Z and Beyonce are notably absent. Some rumours actually even swirled that Jay-Z had turned down the best man position in the wedding because he didn't like the idea that they were filming the wedding for Kim Kardashian's reality show. But hey, who needs a best man because reportedly Kanye West delivered a 45 minute solo toast to himself. I mean, as excruciating best man speeches, this one has truly got to take the cake. How am I supposed to choose a best man when I am the best man? That said, there clearly wasn't too much ill will between these power couples, as Beyonce did publicly congratulate Kanye and Kim on Instagram, and as it would turn out later on Jay-Z's track Friends, he would reveal the reason they didn't come to the wedding. Apparently all the result of the marital trouble that Beyonce and Jay were going through at the time. And if you're wondering, I have covered Jay-Z and Beyonce's marital drama extensively on this channel, so if you want to know the full story of why Solange Muay Thai kicked Jay-Z all the way back into the reasonable doubt days, go give that a watch. Kanye initially told GQ that he didn't care that Jay and Bay weren't at his wedding, because the the only attendee that was important to him was Kim. Oh sorry, no wait, the only attendee that was important was him. This of course later emerged to be Big Cap, as in 2018, Kanye was interviewed by Charlemagne the God, telling him that he felt hurt that Jay and Bay didn't come to the wedding, ultimately suggesting that he didn't care about the issues that they had going on. They should have gone. A small slight between these brothers, a missed wedding, sure, but by 2015, this clearly wasn't enough beef to stop Kanye and Jay-Z getting a bag together. Because in 2015, Jay-Z publicly launched his streaming service title by trotting out a bunch of artist owners on stage because you know rich famous millionaires need to be paid more. And of course Kanye was there on stage looking mad grumps. But despite his outward demeanour, Kanye West's positive relationship with the Tidal streaming service would roll into at least the start of 2016, when in February Ye gets to business on Tidal's behalf, releasing his hotly anticipated album The Life of Pablo initially as an exclusive to Tidal, with some early tweets suggesting that maybe it would only have a week of exclusivity on Tidal, followed by others saying that the album would never be available on Apple streaming streaming services, and the title will be the only place that you can ever get this album. Now seemingly, Kanye West did Jay-Z a massive solid here. The exclusive rights to the life of Pablo took title to the number one app in the App Store in the USA, and reportedly, within a tight 10 day window, Kanye's The Life of Pablo racked up a whopping 250 million streams. I know that number's been disputed, but it's, you can't deny that The Life of Pablo got Tidal popping, in a way that it probably never has been popping since. This was an ungodly amount of streams, especially for a subpar service like Tidal. But by March, Kanye was releasing the track Famous from Pablo as a real radio single, later followed by the same treatment for the track I Love Kanye, with those being released on competing streaming services Spotify Apple Music. So with that in mind, after intense speculation just before we got to April, Kanye released an updated version of The Life of Pablo on Spotify, Apple, and even Google Play Music, aka where music goes to die. Question is, if a popular album is uploaded to Google Play Music and it doesn't get any listens, did it ever even make a noise? No is the answer to that, no. Anywho, this exclusivity finesse left these suckers who had shilled out $10 for Tidal the week before feeling duly scammed. And so within a few weeks, apparently a fan had even filed a class action lawsuit against Kanye and Tidal over suggestions that it was false advertising to say that it would be a Tidal exclusive forever. This lawsuit actually hung around like a real bad fart until around 2019 when it was settled out of court. I hope that dude at least got a Tidal sized bag, i.e. small. But setting aside that behind the scenes drama, we would eventually get hints from Kanye himself as to what had gone down in these backroom deals. With Kanye going on to drop some knowledge on the Jay-Z sampling Saint Pablo track, which was leaked onto Apple Music in March and eventually added to the track listing of Life of Pablo later in the year in June. In this song, Kanye actually says that he nearly signed a $100 million deal with Apple and was even considering giving Jay-Z a $20 million handout to make up for the fact that he would obviously be going against Tidal. But in the end, Kanye ultimately decided to stick within the family and stay with his deal at Jay-Z's Tidal, suggesting that because Jay-Z is essentially a billionaire, Kanye will never go broke if he just continues to rock with whatever his big brother is doing, before going on to hark back to the Taylor Swift incident, saying all he asks is that next time he runs off on stage they all go. Now that's an interesting tidbit to me, because what it really says is that Kanye is still sore about the Taylor Swift incident, particularly the fact that Jay-Z and Beyonce ultimately didn't actually back him up in what was really a stupid but intensely loyal thing to do. Anyway, with that insight it's very clear that Kanye's behind the scene love of his big brother Jay-Z is still going strong. So despite the stolen Coldplay verse, despite missing out Kanye's shit wedding, and despite Kanye losing out on a big bag by going 
going with Tidal instead of Apple Music. But in October 2016, Kimye would be served an incredible curveball as Kim Kardashian is robbed at gunpoint in a Paris hotel room. In a spectacular incident that is truly the stuff of a Hollywood movie, one that would probably go $100 million over budget just trying to find a butt double for Kim, story goes that apparently after showing off some expensive diamonds and her location on social media whilst traveling in Paris, some French gangsters decided to give Kim K the pop smoke treatment. With some hard-boiled Parisian thugs dressing up as police officers and finessing the hotel concierge to lead them directly to Kim's hotel room in a surprise attack around 2.30 a.m. Once inside, they tied up Kim Kardashian and robbed reportedly over $6.7 million worth of jewelry. Kim later said that she feared for her life and even thought she was going to be raped. But apparently, Parisian criminals have higher standards than Kanye and they simply took the jewels and got out of there. Famous sayer of words James Corden actually came out after this incident went public telling people not to joke about what had happened to Kim. Helpful advice from a man who hasn't said a funny joke in 10 years. Kanye was actually informed of this incident literally whilst performing on stage, causing him to immediately rush out of the venue to be at Kim's side, a moment that was caught on camera. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, family emergency, I have to stop the show. Now this incident obviously took an enormous toll on Kim and Kanye, and I don't want to underplay how serious this incident was or how awful this must have been for them to go through. And this was truly exemplified by Kanye's behavior in the weeks that followed, as he would continue to go into long rants on stage, seeming more and more distressed, and eventually telling the crowd that after this very difficult incident that him and Kim went through, he didn't feel like Jay-Z gave him the appropriate response. You call me after the robbery, you say how you feeling? You want to know how I'm feeling? Come by the house. Bring the keys by the house. Right the brothers. Let's sit down. Next one. And as the days went on and Kanye's rants continued, he would continue to keep Jay-Z in his crosshairs, eventually going on to say that Jay-Z should call him and suggesting in a very boneheaded maneuver that Jay-Z apparently has killers on deck. Jay-Z called me, hey bro, Jay-Z, I know you got killers. Please don't send them out my head. Just call me. Talk to me like a man. Now, to be fair, Kanye was actually hospitalized and put under psychiatric evaluation within days of these rants reaching their fever pitch. And some of the more conspiratorial fans may have pointed out the fact that it is a little bit suspicious that within only days of exposing Jay-Z's killers on stage, Kanye had been duly locked up and silenced. Perhaps proof of Jay-Z's true connection to killers and Illuminati whatever the fuck they uh, Illuminati shit is. But of course the reality is much likely way less sinister, with Kanye seemingly suffering a genuine mental lapse under the pressure of what is clearly a very unfortunate and traumatic event for his family. And Jay-Z perhaps giving his little brother just a bit of space to work through these issues in his own time didn't speak on this. However, it is certainly clear that Jay-Z must have felt some type of way of being publicly dragged like this, because in 2017, Jay-Z would end up mentioning this incident on Kanye on the track Kill Jay-Z from his 444 project. Jay says that he felt hurt because he thinks he did right by Kanye, referencing an apparent $20 million tour contract that Jay-Z's Rock Nation had secured for Ye, suggesting that it wasn't fair that after giving him a $20 million opportunity, Kanye gave Jay-Z 20 minutes of shit talking on stage. But Kanye himself actually clapped back at this lyric later on in his interview with Charlemagne, suggesting that it was kind of wrong for Jay-Z to hold this money against him when Kanye was being represented by Rock Nation and it is literally their job to secure him bags. That concept that you gave me, that he gave me the money, that's what frustrated me because actually it, the money was he got from Live Nation. He, Rock Nation was managing me at the time, that's something normal that someone would give someone a, tour, a touring deal. That made me feel like I owed more than just the money itself for the fact that it came from him. A few months after this on wax response from Jay-Z regarding money, things turned even more sour as Kanye would publicly leave Tidal following reports that Kanye was owed a $3 million check relating to just how well the life of Pablo had performed on Tidal. And it's around here that the relationship between Kanye and Jay-Z truly breaks down when the lawyers are involved and payments are being disputed, ugly rants on stage, sneak disses in songs, it's no surprise really that these two were suddenly no longer on speaking terms. Now Jay-Z is famously coy about his personal life and relationships, but we got a few hints 
since in the months that followed. In November, Jay-Z did an interview with Dean Beckett, and when asked about Kanye, he says that there's been a great deal of tension over around a six month period by this point. I hate Kanye the other day just tell him that he's my brother, I love Kanye. I do, it's a complicated relationship with us. Then in 2018, once again, Jay-Z would briefly address his fractured friendship with Kanye whilst appearing on David Letterman's new show. Not going too far into it, but basically saying out and out, they have had a falling out, though Jay still sees Kanye as a brother. Kanye West, uh, uh, are we friends? <laughs> <laughs> are, are we not friends? That's my brother, it's, we, we're beyond friends. Siblings? Yes. You guys ever have a falling out? Uh, I'll let you know when it's over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like that. Yeah. It was that same year that Kanye, of course, addressed a number of these issues that we have already covered in his interview with Charlemagne, an interview that seemingly took place in a low bandwidth version of a real celebrity's mansion, where it seems the majority of his furnishings haven't properly rendered yet. Ultimately, at this point, Kanye said that his relationship with Jay-Z was indeed fractured, but they are at least communicating by text message. You know, um, where you and Jay at now? We good. You know, we, we tweeting, I mean, we texting each other, it's positive energy. Have y'all seen each other? Uh, I haven't seen him, but I, I can feel him. Clearly at a certain point, this becomes a bit of a one-sided relationship. And towards the end of 2018 in September, Kanye returned to Instagram and seemingly extended a small olive branch in the form of a post labeling Jay-Z and Beyonce as family. Notably, Beyonce is actually wearing a pair of heels that at least on first glance appear to be the Yeezy Season 5 PVC clear plexi heels. However, it would later emerge that billionaire Bay was actually wearing basic knockoffs. Because on closer inspection, Beyonce is actually simply rocking a $50 pair of Malibu clear perspex mule heels with wedge, whatever that means. Out here looking like basic Beyonce. Anyway, who knows whether Kanye had actually shared this image out of pure friendship or to promote his shoes or for any other reason. Perhaps the details of the knockoff shoes never got back to him, perhaps he wouldn't even care anyway. But without realizing it, Kanye would make matters worse, again in September when he went on his embarrassing MAGA rampage. Publicly coming out to support Donald Trump and famously wearing a red MAGA hat during his appearance on Saturday Night Live. If someone inspires me and I connect with them, I don't have to believe in all their policies. They bullied me backstage, they said don't go out there with that hat on. They bullied me backstage. And after being publicly bullied for that performance, Kanye decided to hop onto his private jet and bully himself, I assume, with several Big Macs on board and more tweets that saw Kanye sharing once again his MAGA hat and some more political opinions. After this, reports actually begun to emerge that suggested that the real reason that Jay-Z and Beyonce were keeping their distance from Kanye was all rooted in his Trump support. With Jay-Z and Beyonce having publicly endorsed Hillary Clinton before the election and having spent years cultivating a close friendship with former president and three-point god Barack Obama. Oh. Oh. That's what I do. So the MAGA hat was hardly a slam dunk for Yeezus. And the hat actually got a shout out when Jay-Z appeared on Meek Mill's song What's Free in 2019, with lyrics that some people thought initially were taking a little dig at Kanye, saying, no red hat, don't Michael and Prince, me and Ye, they separate you when you got Michael and Prince's DNA. Now Jay-Z was actually forced to explain this line on Twitter after it released, making it clear that the intention of the lyric was to tell people not to pit Kanye and Jay-Z against each other, despite their personal or political differences. Perhaps with this line originally intended to be yet another olive branch to Kanye that was sadly misinterpreted. But hey, Jay-Z, sometimes your lyrics are so deep and cryptic, pretty much everything just comes off as a diss. Kanye clearly wasn't tripping over this and he even replied to Jay-Z's tweet about it, asking when is Watch the Throne 2 coming? And that is a good question. Because if it doesn't drop soon, me and Mario Judah are gonna have to link up and release it for him. Anyway, whilst Watch the Throne 2 sadly never did surface, the closest fans would get to a true public reconciliation between Jay-Z and Kanye Kanye West would come courtesy of none other than P. Diddy, aka Puff Daddy, aka Brother Love, aka Swag, at his 50th birthday party. Diddy's event being a who's who of heavy hitters in the rap game naturally attracted both Jay-Z and Kanye West, who ended up sharing a brief friendly moment at this event that was thankfully captured on film. Who knows what Kanye was saying to Jay-Z in this moment? Maybe he said, I'm sorry for the beef, let's just be friends. Maybe he said, Jay, I need to go back and tweak those drums on Heart of the City so that it hits 
it's just right. Or maybe he just says what he always says. I'm the real life Walt Disney. I'll drop another album on title. All I need is an injection of a billion dollars and a pint of Biggie Smalls blood. All we know is that these two artists essentially came from nothing and together became the biggest giants of the rap game. A lot of shit has gone down on this near 20 year journey with a lot of love lost on both sides. But at the end of the day, they always do and always have seemed like true brothers who would never really hold anything too hard against the other. And sure, I'm sure it stings just a little bit what with Jay-Z's persona of being the first billionaire in the rap game to within only a year to have been net worth gazumped by his little brother's supposed $5 billion Yeezy Gap bag. But the fact is both Jay-Z and Kanye West have clearly influenced each other one and the same over the years to go harder, to make more and better art, ultimately benefiting no one more than the fans. There's no blueprint without Kanye, there's no Jay-Z without the blueprint, and there's no Kanye without Jay-Z. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, make sure that you like and subscribe below. Hit me with a comment. Let me know what you thought was the best bit or other stories that you want me to cover in future. I really appreciate that. If you've really been enjoying the work recently, I would definitely suggest that you go and support on Patreon. If you want to get your name shouted out in the credits and if you want to have a direct line to me and suggesting me stories, I would really appreciate the support. Hey, don't forget to show some love. Go and follow me on Twitter, Instagram, all of that good stuff. I try and reply to everything I possibly can. So if you want to chat, if you want to shoot the shit go hit me up on any of those I'm, I'm just i'm doing it doing it all baby doing i'm out here living living life blah, 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 blah. um sit yeah well i hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching it's been lit i'm trapper ross gang peace out see you next time